Friday afternoon. Hopefully I'm going to get some uh, people uh, available in the middle of the day. So I'm having uh, trouble arranging how I can be compatible with all the people who follow me all over the world in the different time zones. But um, yeah, looking forward to um, sharing this one with you. Um, diet training and life lessons from Aruba. I kind of do this every year. Um, because for some reason, everywhere I go, there's always some kind of lesson in it for me. Um, as spiritual leader Ram Das once said, everything in your life can be used for your transformation if you use it. So um, I think it's one of those things where you just, when you pay attention, things sort of fall into your lap. So that's what this is about. There are many lessons uh, from Aruba and in Aruba when I go every year. Um, and a lot of it has to do, of course, with uh, the industry I'm in. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, take some time and share some of these lessons and maybe they will um, help some of you. Maybe they'll fall on deaf ears, whatever. But uh, I want to make sure also that you all know about I'm going to do back to back webinars because this Saturday I'm going to uh, have my client Byron back on, who's now over 70 pounds of weight loss and ripped and shredded. And uh, yeah, so um, I want to make sure everyone knows about that this coming Saturday, two o'clock my time, five o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'll have Byron and uh, JP on, and there just seems to be so much interest uh, in their transformation. So um, yeah, I want to get all that in there. So just waiting for the audience to build. And then uh, as we do, just... Um, yeah, waiting. Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to take your questions as well. This is going to be a way more uh, laid back lecture than the last few I've done. have all been sort of lecture format with me coming at you with research and stuff. And a lot of people like it. And a lot of people have written me that they don't. They prefer more of the personal stories and things like that. But I have to get the message out there, especially in this day and age of alternative facts, whatever that means. Um, and that it seems that people seem to be entitled to um, their own facts along with their own opinions. And I'm going to get into that another time. But uh, it was ironic that last week I did another uh, post that I knew was emotionally provocative uh, about a vegan diet from an emotional perspective. I just shared a, a video that some other lad had done and it got hijacked by meat eaters, of course. And again, when they can't present research and uh, they can't present a, a cogent argument, what they do is they do ad hominem attacks. So a lot of people were hashtagging to unfollow me. And of course, they were attacking uh, the person in the video and totally missing his point. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to get going with lessons from Aruba. Good to see you all out there. Um, and Rick, uh, I know that you wrote me yesterday on Instagram, Amazing Transformation with Byron. Can't believe he was so big in January. I thought his transformation would have taken longer. Well, that's why I'm going to have him on the show, Rick, because uh, I think it's a mindset thing. Um, as I said in the Instagram post yesterday, this could have been you, not meaning you literally, Rick, but whoever was reading that post. And it's amazing how many people get in their own way. Uh, when it comes to uh, attempted transformation. So that's kind of why I'm going to have Byron on the show, get into the whole mindset element. Um, and speaking of mindset, that's what I want to do today. So um, hello, everybody that's uh, jumping on and getting in. And uh, hopefully uh, some of these lessons from Aruba are going to help you out. What I didn't do this time is I didn't make a bunch of PowerPoint slides with pictures. I could have done that with pictures of myself and the beach and Ange and food. And, but we posted those all along, uh, along the way during that time anyway. So, But if any of this resonates with you guys, by all means, uh, comment during. I'm not going to wait till the end this time. Um, you can comment during. You can share your own um, similar uh, comments and stories as well. But I kind of put this into three sections. Uh, life lessons, which is the most important thing to me at my age, uh, diet and training. But I know if I do the life lessons first, then people are going to sign off because they want the secrets to diet and training. This isn't that kind of webinar, but it is going to be shared observations from um, our trip to Aruba. So first and foremost, the heading I wrote down, I'm using a little Word document so I don't let myself get too off track. Um, no one here to rein me in, and I do go off on tangents for people who follow me who don't know that. 
So I just wrote down, I'm going to start with the diet section. And I just wrote down um, in words that the vegan virgins pop their cherry in Aruba. And what I wanted to do with that was really, I hadn't been vegan that long. And um, I don't know if I was looking at this as a test. I really wasn't. But I was looking at it through the eyes of a lot of people who write me clients and non-clients who say that they can't eat right when they travel. So I wanted to test how hard it would be uh, being vegan and traveling. Now, I was also on my annual refeed, so two weeks of refeed with the cycle diet and trying to take in as many calories as I can. So that made things a lot easier, and I guess that helped. Uh, but I was still pretty uh, blind to the whole process. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to share with this, but even places like Tim Hortons with, you know, donuts and bakery even noticed that even there in the airport they had banana and apples and you know um, yogurt with fresh fruit so it was pretty interesting now our first stop on the way to aruba we have to lay over in toronto overnight so the toronto airport sheraton i didn't know at first when i booked the trip i'm gonna have to go there and have like a every nice restaurant, uh, the Sheraton and the Toronto airport's a really nice place. So it has a nice restaurant, uh, right inside. I didn't know we we're going to have a spring salad and tell them to hold the feta cheese or goat cheese or whatever. And sweet potato fries. That's what was popping in my mind. Have something that's, um, obviously not animal based and that would be it. But of course, uh, preparation in advance, I looked online and no problem. Um, Toronto, uh, uh, the mahogany grill had all kinds of vegan options. Uh, so that was no problem. And then of course, uh, the next morning, um, oh, I, there might be some comments there. Um, yeah, feel free to comment, but yeah, the next morning, so we get up early and, uh, off to the Toronto air airport. And again, no problem finding food and stuff. It was all kind of fun actually. And we looked at it as a foodie adventure and, uh, I give credit for that little phrase to Ange, cause she came up with it. And as we got through security and everything and got settled in, um, I sort of uh, sent Ange on a mission to look for um, vegan food options all around the terminal. Uh, and it was kind of like, like we said, it was more of an adventure not a have to. Um, and I think, you know, quality of mindset determines quality of behavior. I plugged in my computer to check a few things cause I always have to be more or less online. And then Ange went to uh, search and destroy for a vegan options. So it was all kind of fun. Um, and um, that was uh, that was an important thing. So Max is just saying he's off to uh, New York this weekend and he's going to stay on his diet strategy. I prefer the word diet strategy, Max, but yeah, we got you. I mean, and it's all about choice. So I wanted to test out popping our vegan cherry. Uh, the perception that you really can't eat right when traveling. And I don't know if I was eating right. And we were just going to uh, stay to the commitment of eating vegan. So that was very important. And then the first morning in a, in Aruba, uh, of course, no car. So couldn't get groceries yet because I hadn't rented a car yet. So no groceries, but no problem. We left the hotel and went out to the main drag where all the restaurants are, see what was open, see what wasn't open. Um, and sure enough, uh, synchronicity, I'll probably use that word a lot in this webinar because it just uh, so happens, it happens to me a lot. But um, just right down the street, not even a 10 minute walk, um, a restaurant in Aruba called Garden Fresh, which was all about vegetarian and vegan options. So, um, you know, there was no worries and no hurries. And uh, I think that's one of those synchronicity things where the universe conspires to meet uh, authentic commitments. So uh, whether, you know, versus sort of cheesy commitments or convenient commitments, I think the universe conspires when the commitments are authentic. So no way I was gonna violate my commitment to the new vegan lifestyle and then didn't have to. I mean, and people, you need to keep in mind as we did this, I deliberately left for Aruba without prepacking anything. The whole idea was it's going to be vegan and it's going to be vegan without preparation. So uh, other than my meal on the plane, which really didn't um, start my vacation until after that flight, there was really no uh, pre-preparation involved with bringing food with us. So, And I wanted to make that a part of it. And I wanted to see how difficult it could be or would be. So we end up 
um, finding that place and it was great. And then rented a car and then off to the grocery store. And that was easy peasy. Um, what you focus on expands. So the first time shopping at Superfoods compared to the second time and the third time, it's interesting how it became easier and easier to find um, vegan options and fun vegan options, whereas other people see other people see a problem in every opportunity and some people look for the opportunity in every problem the first thing here was we never looked at any of it as a problem so um, we went to the grocery store we posted you know um, vegan groceries that we bought junk food healthy food snack food whatever it wasn't really a problem and then the second and third time we went grocery shopping, I wanted to take Ange to where the expats tend to grocery shop, which is more in town rather than the hotel district, a grocery store called Ling and Sons. Uh, after our long beach walk, we had no food with us. And lo and behold, synchronicity again, the universe conspiring to authentic commitment. Um, we walk in the door and right there on the right at Ling and Sons was a whole um, smoothie juice bar and 90% of it was vegan uh, with all kinds of different herbs and spices and uh, right inside the door. I mean, not even five feet inside the door. And then further down a couple aisles, they had this big, um, you know, um, ready-made food section, like a salad bar, but with way more. And we were there pretty early in the morning, so it wasn't prepared yet. But I'd say a good 50 to 60% of that was going to be vegan as well. Everything from quinoa to chickpeas to um, whatever. So with little effort at all, um, we ended up in the vegan junk food section and I uh, got pictures, I'll post another time, but we had um, chickpea potato chips, uh, jackfruit, uh, Cheetos kind of thing and uh, quinoa chips. And we bought like three big bags of that and did the nom, 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 nom. Uh, all the way back to the hotel. Um, but the point there is, for good or bad, what you focus on expands. And I think we were able to notice way more vegan options everywhere because that's where our focus was. So we stopped focusing and never did focus. See, a lot of people will focus on what they can't have. And since what they focus on expands, that's all they see. We were focusing on finding vegan options, but in a foodie adventure kind of way where it was fun. And guess what? What you focus on expands. We ended up seeing more and more of it without trying uh, to see more and more of it. So then it became uh, menu surfing, which kind of did online before we even left, left uh, mm -hmm. for Aruba. And often people would bend over backwards to help us out. So um, the minute you just mentioned um, that you're vegan, of course, they want to help you out in any way they can because they want your business. So um, often we would even get billed less and wanted me to remind everyone because we didn't have the animal products that are usually were part of a meal. And I remember even here in Kelowna, Boston Pizza did the same for me when I ordered uh, no cheese in my veggie pizza, but double the sauce and some extra ingredients. They didn't charge me for the double sauce or the extra ingredients since I didn't have the cheese. So a lot of people will bend over backwards. Now, I'm going to just pause here, and he's just saying people that get um, stressed when they travel about sticking to a diet are always the same people that get stressed about going off it. Um, to me, that's insane, thinking you've actually voluntarily put yourself in a double bind. This has absolutely nothing to do with the diet itself. Of course, pinpoint accuracy there. Quality of mindset determines quality of behavior. I'm going to get into that when I talk about uh, the self-torment involved that uh, I noticed all around us. So, uh, you know, so the first lesson right there was for good or bad, the reinforcement of the, the expression, what you focus on expands. We were focused on vegan uh, options and fun. And that's what we experienced, the excitement and anticipation of finding them. And that's what we found. And it wasn't that difficult. The menu surfing was fun as well. Now, so having said all that, was it perfect? Hell no. We had some pretty crappy meals, actually. I'll give you an example. We went back to Garden Fresh one day and they were advertising under their vegan section, um, veggie pasta. And this ended up coming to our table. It was pretty nasty. It was basically cut up zucchini and carrots that were made into spirals and they were barely even cooked. I mean, they 
was the furthest thing from pasta and it wasn't cooked and it was just nasty, you know. Um, then we tried a, a veggie burger. Well, that burger didn't even stick together. It was more or less crumbling before it even got from plate to mouth. Um, and then there was an absolutely horrible fajita, veggie, veggie uh, vegan fajita meal at the Hyatt where the ambiance was excellent with black swans floating around us and everything. Uh, but the meal itself was pretty horrible. Um, the, it wasn't cooked enough. It wasn't, uh, it just didn't taste good. And it was, you know, very expensive for something that I didn't like. But the whole point here was the fact how many people use the fact that something isn't perfect or something isn't going totally smoothly as a as an excuse to blow it all up. Oh wow, we, we can't go vegan. That meal sucked. I mean, uh, what are we doing here? Like, let's let's just blow it all up and forget about being vegan because we had uh, one bad experience. And then, of course, Ange reminded me that the year before, when we were still omnivores, we had more than one bad experience eating meat-based food. So, um, but there's the thing: when you have that, was it perfect? Did it go perfect? I never expected it to go perfect. And I think that's the difference. People who get into these kind of diet mentalities where it's perfection or nothing set themselves up for failure. We weren't looking at it that way. Um, even though people tried to accommodate us um, with the vegan meals, there was places that just couldn't do it, and even though they tried and the food ended up being uh, pretty bad. But on the diet front, what you focus on expands. There is even vegan food place in the Aruba airport. Um, and then when we flew back and got to Kelowna, that same restaurant is now um, right outside the Kelowna airport as well. It's called Freshy. You can look it up. Freshy restaurant, uh, F-R-E-S-H-I-I restaurant. When we went up to them in the Aruba airport, um, their first, you know, their first input when we looked at the menu was, we'll make you whatever you want. So basically we made our own um, vegetarian uh, vegan bowl with black beans and chickpeas. And um, yeah, so uh, Scott Walsh is just saying how people always set themselves up for failure. It's all or nothing attitude. That's what I wanted to get across, Scott, exactly, is that uh, people, um, they think it's about perfection and it's not. It's about choices and it's about that things won't always go smoothly. I mean, and that's that should be expected as part of life. Uh, you know, like even flying to Aruba, there could be flight delays, there could be flight cancellations, there could be all kinds of issues. You don't have control over everything. Um, and perfection should never enter into an equation, especially when you're beginning a new path. But again, what you focus on expands and synchronicity uh, when the universe conspires to meet authentic commitments, uh, there's a new boom. So there it is right there, a new uh, restaurant in the, in the, not only in the Aruba airport, which is a small, tiny island, but uh, then again, um, you know, if there's one, the same restaurant right outside the Kelowna airport and Kelowna is a very tiny village as well. So that um, really spoke a lot to me that I thought I would share. Um, if people are authentic in their commitments, the options present themselves. But again, like I said, there's a people who will see a problem in every opportunity and a people who will seek the opportunity in every problem. The difference for us is we never looked at any of it as a problem to begin with. It was just a foodie adventure as part of vacation, as food always is for me on the cycle diet. Now, I will outline preparation. Before we went, I got Ange to put in her phone, Google Translate, to put um, foods, to put words like vegan, vegetarian, dairy-free. I got her to use Google Translate and translate those words into Dutch and Spanish because Aruba is a Dutch island, but it's mostly filled with uh, uh, workers who speak Spanish because they're from South American regions. So, um, so we did do some preparation because proaction is always better than reaction. Um, and um, we never had to use it. So we did all that and never ended up using it. But that's the difference between preparation. Preparation is taking care of the things you can take care of without making excuses for it before you even try. So there was another point that proaction is always better than reaction. And then there's all kinds of apps out there 
uh, that you can use wherever you're going to seek out vegan restaurants, vegetarian restaurants, whether it's an English speaking country or not. Just this morning, my editor Perry uh, forwarded me uh, an app he used for uh, Yelp because he travels a lot and he just types in uh, vegan restaurants near such and such a hotel or whatever. Boom, 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 boom. They all come up. It's never been easier uh, to commit to a diet strategy and stick to it. So, you know, I started the vacation with accepting the perception of people who write me of how hard it is. Because some people write me and they'll use the word naturally and they'll say, naturally, I, I didn't stick to my diet when traveling. Naturally, I couldn't eat right when traveling. There's nothing naturally about that. That's a choice that you made. And I realized that I was right all along in being um, hard on people who use that as an excuse uh, because um, it was really, really, really easy to follow the vegan diet strategy. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of side notes here that are related to diet, related to cycle diet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Rick, you got a long comment there, so I'm going to wait till the end and I'll post it for sure. Now, there was a situation, we were at this place called Iguana Joe's, there's some regular places that I like to go to, and was sat beside a table of uh, four people, three very big ladies, very large ladies, and a gentleman uh, were sitting beside us, and what unfolded over the next hour, hour and a half was actually ended up being kind of hard to watch, so um, we sat down after they sat down, they already had some food. And then I started watching the way they were eating. And one of the ladies, they were taking selfies, they were taking pictures of their food. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But one of the comments, the first comments we heard was the lady said, this is what eating looks like after a diet. Um, and so right away, that kind of piqued my interest. And these were big ladies. I mean, they were... I would say around 200 pounds each, um, you know, various sizes. But um, what it spoke to, what 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 happened there was just an obvious binge. They were binge eating. They ordered, I think, three different trays of like dinner size, family size nachos with everything on them. They ordered appies. They ordered meals. Before they left, they all had doggy bags. Um, they were taking with them and it was just gross to watch them. And this is for me, the cycle diet and the lesson here, absolute versus relative calorie deprivation and the consequences thereof. So what, what I saw unfolding in front of me were people who decided to break their diet. They were like, screw this. And they were making comments about that all along as well, but they were eating like they were on some kind of revenge tour some kind of diet revenge. And I don't even know if they were tasting the food. Like I said, three plates of family size nachos. It, it, it was, it was gross. Um, and there's a difference between a refeed that's enjoyable and a binge eating. I, I, I'm sure the rest of the night, every single one of them would want to be alone in the room just for gastrointestinal issues because they were barely chewing their food and they're having drinks and they're having this food and that food and and making comments about diet and stuff and it was just kind of gross to watch binge eating in public uh, what that must be like for people who suffer it in private but this speaks to the difference between absolute calorie deprivation which they must have been in and just coming out of versus sustainable relative calorie deprivation and one produces results as you see with Byron and my other clients who not only take the weight off, they keep it off, but consequences for these ladies who were still well over 200 pounds or around 200 pounds, I'm just guessing, they were big ladies. Of course, they're going to feel bad about that somewhere down the line, even though they were in full diet revenge at the time and really making spectacles of themselves um, at while they were doing it because they were making uh, no bones about it that this was a reaction uh, to a diet. And rather than learning from it, they rebel against it. So choose the behavior, choose the consequences is what I walked away with there and what a story that was. And a picture being worth a thousand words, I didn't want to interrupt their privacy, but I sure would have liked to have uh, um, 
just shared it with people what that looked like. There's a complete difference between a refeed and a binge. And that was kind of gross. It kind of threw off my appetite actually watching them force feed themselves and kind of like egging each other on to do it. And it also reminded me of research uh, about diet and weight loss about groups that if you really want to keep weight off, then your friends and the people you are around um, is going to speak to how sustainable that is. So that one person who's isolated in the office or whatever, who loses the weight, if that person's surrounded by people who are all overweight, the chances of sustaining that weight loss goes down precipitously. Um, and this group scenario reminded me of that. So uh, if you want to be lean, be around lean people was kind of the message. Um, and it's going to be harder and harder the more isolated you are. So that was one side note that was kind of hard to watch. Another side note, which really speaks to quality of mindset, determines quality behavior. We're going out for dinner one night and there's a little section in the hotel district that has several restaurants right beside each other. And you can look at the menus and we're perusing the menu and behind us is another couple. And I heard a very panicked voice. I turned around and the lady, very agitated and panicked, they're, they're peeking around us, looking at the menu. Um, and she says to her husband, we can't eat here. I'm all out of carbs. I can't have any more carbs. And then she sticks her phone in his face. Like, I guess it was a, you know, a fit day app or some kind of food app or whatever, um, proving that, you know, they couldn't eat there because she was all out of carbs for the day. And that really kind of, was another, you know, diet training uh, and life lessons from Aruba, because no matter how someone looks, if you torture yourself mentally, that's not food freedom. That's not being able to enjoy a vacation, being able to enjoy food, being able to be around food. When you're controlled and tormented by that kind of mindset, and this is why I did the food freedom course, which we'll be releasing in the next few weeks, but. You know, one of the reasons that I get to choose to, sorry, spend time with Ange is as someone who's lost 60 pounds and kept it off, she's not trapped inside the thin cage. She doesn't obsess about, oh no, I might wait, I, I might gain weight again, I might gain weight again, I might gain weight again. If you follow Ange on social media, you know she's posting recipes, she's trying um, she's trying different combinations. She was making vegan donuts the other day. So she's not trapped inside the thin cage like so many former big fat fatties are where their mindset is still trapped like this lady. I can't eat here. I'm all out of carbs, panicked, anxious. Um, and because of my background training competitors, I would never be around any, any, anyone who had that kind of uh, mindset. I, I couldn't tolerate it. I wouldn't be around it at all. So it's fun to have sort of a, a foodie adventure with someone who actually appreciates food, enjoys food, doesn't get the phone out and calculating numbers, etc. I really felt bad for that lady. So that's another side note of what food freedom is, what food freedom isn't. Just because someone looks good on the outside doesn't mean they aren't self-tormenting uh, on the inside with a bunch of nonsense about calories and macros and grams and the rest of it. And the whole benefit of that, of course, is um, the more plant-based you go, the more vegan-based you go, the less numbers matter about anything. So, um, And then Jeremy's just making a really good point. Jeremy's just saying the ironic thing is that a mental attitude shift, I can have it, often results in not wanting it. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, having it regardless of being on a diet or not. Wow, Jeremy, great point. I've always said my trips to Aruba, I practice a counterintuitive diet strategy where I go into my vacations with a mindset of seeing how much weight I can gain rather than not trying to gain any. And within that, I never gain any weight, even though that's my goal. So whereas other people are, again, self-tormenting, that was a great uh, point you just meant. Uh, you just made that counter that that wrong North American diet mentality madness that keeps everyone stuck, even in a place where you go to be unstuck um, is really, really unfortunate. So that was really, really sad for me to witness. And again, it made me appreciate being with Ange, who's the former big fat fatty, um, but has total food freedom. She's not haunted by, um, you know, big fat ghosts of her past. 
or anything like that versus this person who wasn't really all that overweight but obviously is tormenting herself over food. And another side note, just how most places would bend over backwards to accommodate us, um, you know, really wasn't a problem. Although I was disappointed in places like Hard Rock Cafe and TGI Fridays, which you would think would have more vegan options and they really didn't, and they didn't really care to accommodate either. So I'm just throwing that out there. But another thing that I notice every time I go on vacation is, it seems to be that when whenever other people see people who take care of themselves, they all want to talk about diet. So one night, uh, Ange and I were at this place called Yamanja, and behind us were uh, two people that were together, not together together, they weren't a husband and wife or anything. Um, and one of them, I mean, we could hear the conversation was a surgeon or whatever, and then we're doing a clip on our food and sure enough he starts educating her about keto and ketosis and this and that and it's just ironic that wherever we tended to go uh, people always end up around us seem to want to talk about diet for some reason and uh, that was really weird so that was a a bunch of side notes on diet elements uh, lessons there uh, life lessons from aruba diet and training i'm gonna switch to training now and then finish with the life lessons Training wise, um, I should have known better, but I was disappointed going back to the same uh, um, workout facility that we went to last year. Um, we went once the first day and we never went back. Um, again, I, I didn't care that it's hardcore atmosphere, that it's not air conditioned, any of that, but the equipment was already in disrepair last year. So I should have figured in my mind that if it was that bad last year, it's only going to be one year worse. It wasn't going to get better. Um, and it was, it was horrible. There was big chunks. They had concrete barbells from the old days, which was kind of cool, but big chunks of concrete missing from them. Um, they had a T-bar row that was in dangerous position. The floor was unbalanced. So if you stepped on the T-bar row and actually loaded it, you could topple the whole thing while you're on it. Um, little things like that. They had benches shoved right against the dumbbell. Um, the dumbbell racks so you couldn't get near the dumbbells even if you wanted to made no sense and then the people were just really disrespectful toward their own gym and their own there was one guy who, who I don't know what exercise he was doing I never looked but he had the concrete barbell up um, you know up near his collarbone and when he was done his set he just threw it so big chunks of con these weren't bumper plates big chunks of concrete went flying out I'm thinking you're just ruining this for yourself and then the girl at the front desk, uh, we're spoiled here where I work out in Kelowna because there's a very nice young lad who, who works the front desk who says hello and goodbye to everybody. And he's never distracted. But the girl at the front desk here in Aruba, feet up on the, feet up on the counter, uh, scrolling through her phone the whole time. Um, not a care in the world. So my point there is behavior is a reflection of management. And I doubt that place uh, will be there much longer. I doubt it'll be there uh, next year. No, most of the equipment doesn't even work anymore. Uh, and then lo and behold, the very next day when I had resigned myself to working out at the Holiday Inn, um, what they would call their gym, it's really pretty crappy. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I resigned myself to just doing some workouts there. Um, and then lo and behold, that synchronicity thing again, we're at Garden Fresh having that, uh, having our breakfast and uh, a, a lad walks by me and kind of looks twice and uh he says scott the trainer and i said yep and uh, turns out he was the head trainer at la cabana resort and he invited us there to work out and uh, go there and it was the exact opposite um air conditioned a very efficient use of space brand new machines everything worked very friendly staff at the front desk greeted you every day even though they didn't speak very good english it was always smiles and towels and um very very good one of the things that always makes me um, scratch my head though in Aruba and these places is all the cardio equipment that they put in even small little facilities that, um, you know, the principles don't matter as much as the client's expectations. So you know, here you are with a stretch of beach that's beyond compare around the world and people are inside on the cardio machines and that always makes me scratch my head, um, you know, uh, and that, you know, that was the same case there. Now, the one lesson I can give you about training 
Uh, the one time I worked out at the Holiday Inn gym because I didn't work out there really after I got invited to La Cabana. It was just a very nice setup there. Shout out to Renee for inviting us. Um, but the one time I worked out at, at the Holiday Inn gym, and it was a terrible gym. I mean, you'd really have to know what you were doing to work out there. It's a couple hundred square feet at best. It's got a few pieces of cardio equipment and dumbbells up to 50 pounds and then a jungle gym that is kind of okay. But um, so while I'm in there working out one day, two ladies come in and the first thing they do is go right to the weight scale and weigh themselves. So, all right. So they go weigh themselves and then they, of course, they get right on the elliptical, both of them. So I'm working, working out. And so, um, after about, I don't know, half an hour or whatever, one of the ladies gets off the elliptical, comes over to the little dumbbell area where I am, and she does a bunch of sets of crunches, just, you know, normal ab crunches, nothing too difficult. Then she gets up and weighs herself again, and she shakes her head in disgust, and she goes over to the other lady, and they're talking um, in Spanish, I guess, and then uh, gets back on the cardio equipment, and then after they both get done, they go and weigh themselves again. So the one lady's weighed herself three times. The other lady's weighed herself twice. And then they do a high five and then they leave. And wow, I just, I'm just sitting there perplexed and puzzled. And it just reminds, reminded me of the huge gap between regular gym goers, which is 90% of the people who go to work, gyms to work out, versus those who seek fitness knowledge online from people like myself and you know my youtube channel and my podcasts and things like that that gap is so huge um and that information isn't knowledge and knowledge itself can take years and years to apply before you have a real grasp and understanding of that knowledge so it was a real reminder for me of that gap and it also reminds, even here uh, at, in my home gym, people ask me for advice and then they don't take it. Um, so it's really quite ridiculous that expertise still hasn't penetrated the average gym goer. And myself, I wouldn't take part in anything where I couldn't see positive results from doing so. I don't know why people think showing up is enough. And those two ladies I feel bad for uh, because they think that their weight changing within 45 minutes of being in, you know, a hotel gym facility is meaningful. It has no, no meaning at all. And, uh, kind of struck me that, um, that this kind of mindset still, um, you know, is pervasive out there, that it's something that you can witness, you know, no matter where you are. So that was really, really strange to me as well. And then of course, just common disruptions of gym etiquette, which I don't need to get into. And then finally, what I want to get to is the life lessons or what I'll call life fitness, because those are the biggest, most important things to me. Uh, you know, the diet and the training and all that. Um, oh, Alice is just saying, um, Scott, how do, why do you refer to overweight people as big fat fatties? How do you think that makes people feel? Is there another way you can refer to us? I really, um, I can't see the rest of it, Alice. You must not have wrote that on my on my uh, comment thread, but um, you must have missed, uh, and my apologies go out to people who think that I'm talking about you. That's just a joke between Ange and I. When we Ange refers to her former picture, she calls herself a big fat fatty, and that's what we kind of jokingly do to, to sort of take the power out of the term. It's actually the opposite reason. So uh, Alice, thanks for writing, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, there's no um, ill intent there. Um, it's just a, a phrase that we picked up. I can use it another way, but uh, thanks for writing on that. Um, so finally, the life, the life lessons. And uh, every year I go to Aruba, um, you know, I make a note of just how much other baggage we all pack and take with us on vacation. And it strikes me how some people never unpack their tension or their stress and leave it where it should be. <laughs> they pack it, they take it with them, and they unpack it, and they wear it like clothes, and then they pack it up and take it back with them. Um, and uh, it's always a surprising. There's always a lesson every year for me. I say the same thing that I go to Aruba, and every year I'm always surprised by the time I get there how much tension I realize that I'm carrying. Even though I'm very laid back and zen in my life, 
um, and I'm fully aware of what builds up over the course of a year. So, uh, for instance, um, this is was this was something that sort of unfolded in a surreal way where I'm watching myself and can't believe how stressed I'm acting and I'm embarrassed by it because of how Zen I am and the rest of my life. So we have to overnight in Toronto. We overnight in Toronto, we get through security. We're sitting down. I'm going to plug in my computer and check on things. And I can't find my power cord to my laptop, which is my lifeline to my business when I travel. And I check the I, I check the laptop bag five, six times. I can't find it. Where could it be? And then so I have to go back through security again, go back to the hotel, run up the stairs, get a key to the room, which they had already like I've already checked out. They let me in. Of course, the power cord isn't there. I run back downstairs. I'm all in a huff. I'm all in a tizzy. I go through security again. I go back to my laptop bag and uh, I look and sure enough, in the very bottom, there's a tear uh, in the bag and the power cord was there all along. And I couldn't believe how embarrassed I felt uh, because this is part of my story every year, uh, realizing the tension that I have. And I have no doubt I'm running around like a chicken with no head and I'm, you know, oh my God, where is it? I'm going to, you know, run out of power and I won't be connected to my business and what if you know what if Mike needs me and all these other things and I have no doubt that if it was three days later while I was in Aruba I, I have no doubt that none of that would have happened I would have found the power cord even though I searched that bag three or four times before I panicked and went through security so I'm just saying there the life lessons that a lot of people will brag about not even taking vacations and I can't even imagine how much unconscious stress and tension they have built up that they're not even aware of. Um, so it's very, very important. And then of course, once I get to the hotel, I'm always like, I notice when I'm in line to check in, I'm rocking back and forth. I just want to get to my Aruba vacation. And then I watch and I listen to other uptight people on the beach in the hotels and how some of them were never, ever truly present where they were. They brought their lives and their stress with them and they only unpacked it to wear it with them everywhere they went. So you'd see people walking along the beach and they're, you know, you can hear them like talking seriously and bitching about their lives back home and, and things that are going on and, and tense, tense, tense. And here they are like on some of the prettiest sandy beaches and, and Caribbean blue that, you know, people around the world would just dream to ever see. So uh, it's really, really important. And then it struck me, you know, I'm posting pictures of, of crabs and barracuda and the eel. And none of that happens if you're not truly present in the moment and paying attention to where you are and what you're doing. And so many people missed the opportunities of seeing all that stuff because they're walking along the beach talking about their lives at home and not really even paying attention to the feel of the sand on their toes. Um, you know, the sort of eye massage of the Caribbean blue, um, all of that stuff, uh, they were never really truly present. And I, I find that to be a shame. The other thing that is still boggles my mind and shows what an old fart I am to this day is what I call blurred lines. And maybe you guys can can uh, comment on this. Uh, Ange, I'm going to get to that one in a sec. Um, so this is most disturbing to me. How much does technology actually contribute and how much does it detract from life experience in our day and age? Now, first, I'll make a point. Technology allowed us to include everyone else uh, posting pictures and videos from our vegan vacation, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously it allowed us uh, to contribute to sharing that our experience there. However, you know, I noticed a lot of times where people were alone together and together alone because of technology. I'll give you a few examples. Um, where we stay, there's a section in the lobby that's set out, that's deliberately set out in some kind of like, um, you know, some designer made it that way where, you know, long lounge uh, couches that face each other that are conducive to interaction, surrounded by lounge chairs and other chairs that sort of overlook this beautiful walkway um, to the beach and the pool. And I pointed out to Ange one day, what do you notice? 
And what you noticed was that area was really crowded because it's also a place where people sit if they're just checking in, just arriving, or they're just leaving and waiting for a taxi to go to the airport. And I said to Ange, what do you notice? And what you notice is that everyone was staring at a screen, some with or without earbuds. No one was really interacting, even though that whole area was busy and crowded. And it was deliberately set up to be conducive to interaction. And funny, I started going there 20 years ago. And I remember that's where you would go sit and talk to people from from Holland or the States or whatever. And it was just, that's what you did. You interacted and you, you know, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm, you know, and you met people and uh, it's just seemed like that was gone. And then along those lines with being addicted to your phone, one day I'm walking on Beach Boulevard and I see a lady trying to share that walk with her daughter, but her daughter's like three steps behind her looking down at her phone screen with earbuds in her ears. So it really kind of represented that I was witnessing this over and over again and disturbs me how real life is less of an experience than the digital world experience. And that real life now is ho hum compared to the hum of your phone screen. And we're dulling our senses to the things that should be lighting them up. Here's a young girl, 16, 17, 18, maybe she's in the Caribbean white sand, massaging her toes, blue caribbean ocean massaging her eyes and she's glued to her phone screen with earbuds in her ears she can't hear the waves she's not looking at anything and that the screen is more important than the surroundings is like why go so it's very very freaky to me and then i witnessed this is another example then i witnessed a man maybe late 30s early 40s with his family who rented a floaty. A lot of people rent those rubber floaties. They got the nice pillow on them and you can just sort of float in the water. He rented a floaty so he could have his phone with him in the water when he was in the water with his kids. Mind blowing. And sure enough, I watched him. He, his kids were like six, seven. Um, so they go into the water. He brings his floaty. He brings his phone. He puts his phone on the floaty. And about, you know, every two minutes he's, checking his phone. I'm like, unbelievable. And then so all this is going through my mind. And I'm sharing this, uh, you know, whining and bitching and complaining about it to Ange. And we go to the mall that day, we're walking around the mall. And I have the world's smallest old man bladder. So I had to go to the washroom. So I said, I'll be right out. And what happens is we're having this very conversation about people addicted to their technology. I get to the urinals, and the fellow next to me having a pee on the urinal with his phone. Phone out, texting and peeing. I mean, what about splashback? What about health? What about, I mean, unbelievable. That can't wait 30 seconds till you relieve yourself. I, I, I just mind boggled. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was sexting a picture of his parts to somebody, but it just seemed really freaky to me that, um, you know, I, I don't have a phone plan. So I use my phone to take videos and, and pictures and that's it. And I seldom take it with me. So that was really weird to me. And then the other thing was just all the drones now that are in the air flying around the beach. Uh, also a pretty freaky experience. So um, anyway, the technology, that question is perplexing to me. How much does it contribute? How much does it take away, especially for the younger generation where they can no longer be excited about a real life experience unless it's represented on their screen first and foremost. So, I mean, that that's uh, wow. So now the other thing for me being very Zen and stuff, I'll do one more story and then I'll get going, is how important, uh, one, the, the best part of my day in Aruba every day, the reason I rent an oceanfront room um, is because I like to watch daybreak over the Caribbean ocean uh, every morning. That's my Zen thing. That's my uh, favorite part of the day. And it's a really, really important part of my day there, watching daybreak in the quiet, listening to the waves, listening to the birds. The people aren't up yet because it's like five or six in the morning. And a, a little joke I did do with Ange all the time is as soon as I get up in the morning, I pull back the curtains to make sure they, that the ocean's still there. And I say, oh, good, it's still here. Um, so I would go down and get us coffee every morning 
and um, the lad that run the, the the coffee bar, he would even come in early if he was working and sort of because he knew I was there sort of chomping at the bit to get my coffee. And uh, even on the sitting on the oceanfront terrace, uh, watching daybreak, there was even a couple times where Ange would come out and want to show me something on her screen. And I would say, Ange, I got all day to look at your phone. I have like a few minutes to watch this beautiful site. And for the two weeks I'm here, show me later. So I'm pretty hardcore about that. So, um, but that's how important that Zen unpacking of stress and tension is and to just experience and have that wash over me. So very, very important. And then as Ange was mentioning in her comments, um, so during, a, I think it was our last day or second last day, the power went out in the whole neighborhood, all the hotels, et cetera. And we just sat there and observed people losing their minds. Um, uh, and it's funny, when I first started going to Aruba, you couldn't barely get any internet. It was a place you would go to get away from the internet, but people were complaining and they were, they were whining about, you know, this and that and why they got to be connected. And, and uh, it was just weird. And then within about half an hour to 40 minutes, all of a sudden you saw more people on their hotel balconies than you saw the whole trip. All of a sudden you could hear the water. There was no music playing. There was no, it was just sort of very like, you know, forced Zen when people were actually experiencing it. But along those lines, as much as people were dominated by technology and that was an easy thing to witness every morning when i went down to get coffee you have to remember it's it, nothing's open yet nobody's up yet it's just the staff and janitorial staff but every morning that i went down there to get coffee there was this man a few years older than than me sitting in this area that opens up to the pool and the pool opens up uh to the beach and he's sitting there every morning with a hardcover book a uh, little hat, t-shirt, shorts, flip-flops. And the aura that he gave off, I, after a few days, I so desperately wanted to sort of walk up to him and say, excuse me, sir, and introduce myself and stuff. Um, because of his energy, the aura he gave off was just completely calm, completely peaceful in such an intensity that you could feel it like just being around it i could look at him I, and i could aspire to be like that and every morning i'd say to myself that's who i want to be the calm energy just flowed out of, out of him and he was by himself every morning down there it's like five o'clock in the morning five thirty in the morning he's just sitting there with his legs crossed uh reading a book and just had this sort of peace about him it was very very uh surreal to me uh, to see that that's what i call life fitness when you can see and witness that in other people. And then finally, I'm just going to con, uh, you know, comment on a couple positives and negatives on the consequences of lifestyle. So that day that the power went out at poolside, there's a very, very uh, obese man at poolside. He's about 400 pounds and never saw him away from, never saw him away from the beach, never saw him away from lounge chair, always had the umbrella up. And when the power went out, he was looking for help from anybody because he couldn't walk up the stairs and he had to take his meds and he had to have a nap because of his meds or something. Um, and he was very stressed about, well, the first thing the generators kicked in and the, the elevators were working within minutes. So it really wasn't uh, that big a deal. But you see the restrictions on someone of that weight. But the ironic thing is the self-delusion. After he had his nap and his, took his meds, I guess, he came back down. He was sitting beside some people that we see every year. And he made a comment on how he never gets sick. Well, you are sick. You're very sick. You're so sick that you can't walk up some stairs to take, and you need to take meds at a certain time or you might die and you need to lay down in the midst of Aruba. And these are people who are restricted by lifestyle and they're ill and they don't even realize it. So we never see people like this walking the beach and then they would never see things that we saw, giant sea turtles, um, eels, barracuda. So very, very thing to witness how um, the consequences of lifestyle um, and how that impacts people and they don't even, they're not even consciously aware of it. So that's really important. And then finally, you know, uh, on a positive note, out of the mouths of innocence, uh, people who say more than they realize they're saying at the time. One of the things that really struck me on our trip, uh, life lessons from Aruba, life fitness lessons from Aruba, 
uh, those of you who are still left, um, if you remember when I did the transformation story webinar about Ange way back when on how uh, 60 pounds of when she first, you know, we, we posted her pictures of her when she was big. I won't say big fat fatty because, you know, it, it, people are getting the wrong impression. But um, and we, I remember pointing out to you in that webinar, her goal wasn't to get on a physique contest stage and all this other stuff or to have abs. Her goal was to be able to wear pretty clothes someday and look feminine. And uh, if you can go back and track that webinar if you want. So we fast forward all these years, that was 10 years ago, 60 pounds overweight. And all she ever wanted to do was she looked at nice clothes and someday be able to wear those nice clothes and feel feminine. And here out of the mouths of innocent people, what struck me, my carry on, carry home point of that trip of Aruba, I was struck by how many times other ladies stopped us while we we're on our way to dinner. Other ladies, other women just would stop us and tell Ange how beautiful she looked or how pretty her outfits were and did she buy them in Aruba. This happened, I kid you not, almost every single night that we went out, someone would stop us to comment on how pretty Ange looked or um, how feminine her clothes looked, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking how deeply meaningful that must be for Ange, how these ladies have no idea who are stopping us on the street that Ange was 60 pounds ago now living out her dream transformation in ways other people could see and witness to the point of stopping us in our, in our tracks to comment on just how great she looked. So um, that was a real carry home point for me. And I think that was a real positive fitness thing for me, why I do fitness and very, very important as well. So to have people stop her and not realize that, you know, 10 years ago, she was 60 pounds overweight with a goal to just look uh, and be able to wear feminine clothes again and people are stopping her to point out that very thing well that was a pretty pretty cool stuff so i'm going to end on that one um so hopefully you guys benefited from this in some way on the diet the training or the life fitness lessons from aruba um and again bringing it to you i'll be back on saturday uh with uh byron and his 70 pound weight loss so as you can see, I segue out of that conversation pretty quick before I started crying. But that was really impactful for me uh, that so many ladies would stop Ange and comment on how feminine she looked, how beautiful she looked, not realizing that uh, she was 60 pounds ago dreaming of that very thing. On that note, I will see you all next time.